Amen. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 is where we will start. And if you're able to stand for the reading of God's word, we invite you to do so. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, the word of the Lord says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because, quote, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this evening for this opportunity on the prayer line uh, to, again, get in the word of God and, and hear a little bit more every day, a little something more. Uh, that we may grow spiritually. Bless us tonight as we consider this theme. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to speak on the topic of a, a healthy diet, growing spiritually, a healthy diet. Uh, Jesus often used life situations to illustrate a divine truth in what we call parables. And so I'm going to ask you to observe with me uh, the growth we see in little children, uh, our own little children or others with as well, or, or even what we see in our own development physically and mentally. Uh, see, if we don't find some divine truths which speak to our spiritual development and which might assist us in sparking uh, spiritual growth in our lives, Peter in this letter refers to the early stage of growth known as infancy, in which babies are born and are dependent on their parents for food in order to grow. If you've given birth in the past few decades or have been around someone who has, you may have come across the debate concerning breastfeeding and the renewed vigor behind the movement to encourage mothers to breastfeed. More and more, the studies are showing breastfeeding to be best for babies, that there are positive effects such as protection from illnesses uh, and, and other things. Uh, a mother's milk contains the vitamins and the nutrients which nourish a child's body and cause the child to grow. Formula for those of us who desire to be part of that aspect of a child's life, like I was, uh, can be helpful, especially if it's iron fortified, which comes naturally in the mother's milk. Some studies are showing formula fed babies have a much higher rate of childhood obesity than breastfed babies, and a few other negative consequences from bypassing breastfeeding in lieu of formula. The key, though, is that babies, in order to grow, in order to develop, in order to become all that they're born to be, babies need to be fed and fed well. A malnourished baby may suffer from a lack of muscle development, it may develop a liver disease. Uh, a malnourished child may not grow the way well-fed children grow, and it, it may not be evident to parents until the child is measured and weighed and those figures are compared with other children's numbers. The first thing a doctor will ask when a child is not developing physically the way others are is about the diet of the child. Is the child getting enough to eat? How often is the child eating? What is the child eating? A healthy diet is paramount for proper physical development in children. Well, Peter wrote to the Christians under his charge concerning their spiritual growth, and he utilized infancy and healthy eating as the parable. A newborn infant longs for the pure milk, and a newborn again Christian should long for the pure spiritual milk to be fed in such a way as to grow into salvation. In the preceding verses, going back to chapter one, verses 23 and 24, Peter stated that as newborns, there was a connection to the word of God, that we were born not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Going forward and looking at chapter two and verse four, Peter wrote to these newborns in Christ that we are to come to him, Jesus, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. His metaphor shifted then from discussing infancy 
to addressing a house being built up. But if we were to apply the same concept of physical growth and a construction project going up to our spiritual growth, the notion will be the same. We can't grow up without a connection to Jesus. The same way a child grows best when breastfed by his or her mother is the same way we as Christians will grow best when we are fed by Jesus directly. Now, Peter back in chapter one told us we were reborn in Christ through the living and enduring word of God. He quoted Isaiah 40 in verse eight about how everything else will wither and fade away, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. Indeed, it was God's word, which had often been cited throughout biblical literature as what will nourish the soul of the believer and provide guidance and strength for life. When he was tempted in the wilderness, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8 and said that humans do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God. See, physical sustenance has its place, Jesus seems to have been saying, but God's word will sustain a person's soul through any and all danger. David in the 119th Psalm referenced God's word as relevant for spiritual development throughout one's youth and into adulthood. He credited the happiness in people's lives to being directly responsible to following God's laws, doing things God's way, following how the Lord wants us to live. In Psalm 119.9, it says, how can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. I once had a group of kids playing out in the parking lot of the, of the church, uh, playing basketball. And when we took a break of uh, playing basketball, I, I broke out the Bible and began to read that 119th Psalm to them. And I shared with them an article I'd found which showed kids who go to church every Sunday have lower dropout rates. They have better rates of going, getting into college. They have lower crime rates and so forth. And I asked the kids what they thought about both the scripture and the statistics. And they were not surprised at all. Makes sense, one of them said. Because if you're going to church, you probably have less time to get in trouble. Another one said, if you're going to church, you hear God's word. And you're reminded more of what's right and what's wrong and what God wants for us. Out of the mouth of babes, I tell you, God has declared his strength. Life works better when we follow God's word. God's word isn't just some fairy tale or some ancient document whose time has passed. It is indeed written by human beings, uh, but it's human beings who have tried it their way, seen God's word put to the test, lived life and figured out that God's way is the best way and tried to write all that down for all of us to learn. In that 119th Psalm, David tells us how much he loves God's word, how his life is so much better when he follows God's laws. He tells us in, in Psalm 119 verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is spiritual food for the soul. It's what nourishes our souls. It's the spiritual milk which causes us to grow, to live like Jesus, and to affect people's lives like Jesus did. You cannot become like Jesus if you're not reading about who Jesus is, if you're not hearing what Jesus taught, if you're not learning what Jesus did. But if we get into the word, when we reach those times in life when we're not sure what's right or what's wrong, it's God's word that is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. It's God, God's word that nourishes us and feeds us and gives us strength to become spiritually Jesus' hands and feet and arms and legs in this world. Now, throughout Jesus' temptation in the wilderness in Matthew 4, the devil used scripture too, twisted it, took it, applied it in ways God never intended and for purposes God never ordained. But Jesus, knowing God's word, uh, having been raised in God's word, having been called by God's grace, having been able to quote scriptural passages in their right context and apply them to life appropriately, Jesus stood strong against the abuse of scripture employed against him by the devil. Paul wrote to Timothy once that we got to rightly divide the word of truth which means there is a, 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 a way to wrongly divide the word of truth. And that's what Satan was doing in Matthew 4. I was reading this week uh, some of the arguments about breastfeeding and formula. And one of the arguments against formula was those who use well water. Apparently some well water, not all, but some are contaminated with nitrates, which when mixed with formula can cause nitrate poisoning to the child. 
Well, spiritually, if things aren't going right, if we're not growing right, if we're not becoming stronger in our faith, if our spiritual muscles are atrophying, if we're not breathing out the breath of life, we may need to look at our spiritual diet. Some of us may be eating poisonous spiritual food. We may be listening to folks and reading folks and taking in thoughts from folks who do not love Jesus, who are not preaching the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Sometimes they mention Jesus. Sometimes they're even in churches with jobs as pastors, but they're far more into themselves, what they look like, how many followers they got, and how, many, how much money they're making from their church and from their ministry. Uh, we may be ingesting spiritual poison, and spiritual poison will get you spiritually sick. Spiritual poison can make you stop loving like Jesus. It'll make you stop being holy like Jesus. Your countenance might change from being full of joy to being full of hate. Spiritual poison can cause spiritual death. I was talking to an old uh, seminary professor. Actually, she was the dean of the college, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Condi Frazier. Uh, and she shared with me a story once about when her husband, Dr. Ira Frazier, uh, that her husband and her found a bunch of ants in their kitchen uh, back when they were living in California. And they would stomp out the ants whenever they saw them. But one day, they stomped on an ant, and a blue color came out of the ant. They stomped on another one, and a green color came out of the ant. Then a purple color, and a yellow color, and so on. And so Dr. Ira Frazier tracked where the ants were coming from, and he finally figured that in the cabinets, the food coloring had been left unsealed and the ants had been eating food coloring so that every time the ants were pressured or squeezed, what came out of them, what they had been eating was revealed. Well, the same can be said of us. What we've been eating when the temptation comes, when the devil comes at us, when the, when the going gets tough, when we can't see our way, what we've been eating spiritually will emerge and we'll be able to tell what we've been eating. If we've been eating poisonous foods, like what Peter described in that second chapter, he said, stop eating all malice and all guile. Stop eating insincerity and envy and slander. But when the time comes, uh, that's what's going to come out when you get under pressure. If we've been eating pretense and show and arrogance, instead of humility and love and grace and mercy and peace and joy and patience, then when the trouble comes, what we've been eating will come out. And I got to tell you, I would love to have us at Zion be a church full of folk who when the trials start, when the devil gets busy, when it gets so hard, I want us to be so well fed by the word of the Lord. So no matter what the devil throws at us, We've got God's word coming out of us. Huh? You lost your job? My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Somebody got sick? I am the Lord that healeth thee. Friends turn their back on you and you're feeling all alone? The Lord will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Burdens are too heavy to bear? Cast all your cares on Jesus, for he careth for you. The word comes out during the pressure. The word overflows. The word lights up our dark nights and leads us through life storms, strengthens us when we're weak and lifts us up when we're down. It's God's word that we need to be feasting on. Now, one last thought. More and more studies are showing that there is a benefit for babies to have a set regular meal time where the children of all ages eat a meal, <laughs> excuse me, with their parents. Studies show these children are smarter, that they develop vocabularies quicker. They learn how to talk by talking with their parents and older siblings at the dinner table. These children are unlikely to smoke, drink, or take drugs if they have a regular time to talk with the family members about life. And these children actually eat better, healthier meals, but if they eat a regular, because they've eaten a regular meal with their family members. Well, spiritually, that's why we are a church. It is beneficial to the children of God of all ages for us to regularly feast on the word of God together. We will be spiritually smarter. We will know scripture more. We'll hold each other accountable. 
We can avoid bad habits. We can bear one another's burdens. We can sharpen each other. We can pray for each other. We can love one another. We can edify the body of Christ and we'll eat a healthier spiritual diet at the church than we will on our own, on some radio or podcast or uh, some television guy that doesn't know your name and you don't even know anything about their spiritual life. That's called spiritual fast food, spiritual junk food. And it's unhealthy, sometimes unholy, many times ungodly, and it will come out in our spiritual life. Come to church, folks. Get to the house of God. We need each other. Get on the prayer line. Get yourself together with the body of Christ, with a pastor who loves the word of God, with deacons and deaconess who love the word of God, with a prayer line community and a church family that loves the word of God. God set it up for us to help each other to grow and to grow spiritually together. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let us pray tonight. Father, we thank you for this time on the prayer line, and we're praying, Lord, that we can continue at Zion to be a place where the word of God is produced and fed for everybody there. I pray, God, for everybody on the line tonight that they may have a commitment to having a spiritually healthy diet, reading the word of God, hearing the preached word of God, hearing teaching of the word of God, putting all these things into practice. But, Father, I'm praying mostly for that diet right now that we need a spiritually healthy diet on the word of God. And I pray that Zion will continue to feed people the word of God so that we may grow spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. Have a good night. We'll see you in the morning, 8 a.m., prayer line. Uh, join me and meet me there at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Have a good night, everybody. All right, Mrs. Laverne. Have a good night. God bless.